Okay, so welcome to another remote edition of the Write the Docs Australia um, Meetup events. This is, I, I don't know, this is probably a third or fourth. I think I've lost count of how many remote events we've done so far, but it's, it's looking like it's here to stay for a while, but I think it works well. Um, as a community, we get a lot of participation from different people all over the world and also Australia specifically and um, other sort of neighboring um, countries. It's always a good thing. So I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if um, Nathan's in the call yet, but I'll get started on just an introduction of what we have planned for today. Um, so Docs Code, I, I'm not sure how many of you have worked with Docs Code before, are familiar, and Nathan will probably go more into this in detail, but that's that's like this um, central theme of our event today. Um, yep, so Nathan's gonna talk about how to deploy and host Docs Code. Um, and then we've got a lightning talk by Cameron Shorter, who's who's the working on the Good Docs project. So he's got a little bit of a teaser in terms of what they're doing there. And then we also have some um, updates on our conference that's coming up this um, December, and I'll, we'll wrap up after that. So let's get going. For people who haven't been to one of the Write the Docs events before, it's a series of conferences and local meetups. Um, focus on all things related to documentation. Um, we have the word software documentation, but I'm not sure if it's that sort of relevant anymore. We've got a lot of people across different kinds of documentation um, that contribute to our community. So it's always a good thing. Um, we call ourselves documentarians. So it's, it's pretty much instilling the fact that we are all, regardless of what our job titles are, we're documenting, we're writing, we're passionate about documentation. Uh, a word on the code of conduct. So make sure you're friendly and welcoming in your speech. Be respectful and be careful in the words that you choose. Uh, if you believe someone's violating this code of conduct, and I guess it applies to remote events as well. If during one of our events, uh, if you see or hear something that is uh, you think is violating the code of conduct, make sure you contact a member of the staff. Just a quick sort of a snapshot of where we are at as a community, right? The Docs Australia has got over 800 members now. So it's a big hurrah. Uh, this is over the last four years. So there's a lot of people who want to join in, contribute, share their experience and knowledge. We've done about 45 meetup events and a lot of them remote this year. And la last couple of years, we've had webinars as well. And we've also had three annual conferences. How do you get involved with Write the Docs? You have it if you haven't sort of been on one of these channels before. So there's a mailing list that you can sign up for, which has a lot of information about what's happening with uh, the community worldwide. There's also the global meetups link, which will point you to wherever you are um, across the world. If you if there's a meetup close to you, you can sign up, join in, share, contribute. There's also the a very active Slack channel. Plus there's also the Write the Docs Australia, which is this meetup page where you would have signed up for this event. Um, I'm just gonna pause here for a second. I just wanna make sure um, Nathan's online with us. Nathan, if you're here, if do you wanna sort of say hello? Hi, I don't know where I'm appearing on everybody's screens, if I am at all. Um, I'm in the blue shirt. Uh, actually, this is my Sydney data center shirt. Uh, which I thought would be fitting for this. Um, I apologize if my cat attacks me or walks in front of the camera at any point <laughs> of the, the demo. Um, I live in Philadelphia, so it's 10 p.m. here. I work for a company called Linode. Linode is a hosting company. Um, we've been around since 2003, so it's not a new company. Um, and we really pride ourselves on using open source everything um, and being affordable and just having like good simple values for what you would want out of a host that you can trust basically. Oh. Um, and I- Sorry, sorry to cut you off then, Nathan. Do you, would you like to share your slides? I can, I'm happy to stop sharing and you can take over. That sort of nicely blends into your talk then, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, I'll stop sharing and yeah, if you wanna take over the okay. yeah, presentation. Uh, one moment. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, so I am um, on the technical writing team at Linode. We publish a guides and tutorials library uh, that covers both our own products, 
um, because we have our own products, but it also has a bunch of like just general interest cloud computing stuff. So like how to install Apache and how to set up a Kubernetes cluster and how to make a Minecraft server, all sorts of stuff. And we just hope that it, it's basically as helpful as it can be. Um, if somebody comes to the docs and the guys do tutorials and then they decide this is helpful, I want to be a Linode customer, then all the better. But we do honestly want to position it as a public good as well. Um, so that's the team that I'm on. Um, and today I'm going to kind of go through how we host our docs. Um, the talk is about docs as code. So docs as code is, let me see, Oop, too far. So docs as code is this methodology where you're trying to align the tools that you use when you're writing docs and publishing them to be the same as the tools that you use when you're writing software or maybe more accurately, your engineering team is writing software. Um, so you're just trying to basically get on the same page as a team like a software development team. Um, and there's a bunch of benefits for doing this. Uh, just briefly, the methodology is composed of using version control software. So Git, for example, um, writing in plain text doc files as opposed to like Word docs or in Confluence or something like that. Um, running automated tests. Um, that can be a bunch of different things. Uh, a primary use case is checking for spelling and grammar automatically whenever somebody tries to merge new documentation. Um, and then practicing continuous integration and continuous delivery. And that basically means like frequently merging your work and frequently publishing your work and doing so in a way that isn't um, prone to failure uh, or unexpected surprises. Um, the benefits I consider being a tighter bond between the writing and the engineering teams. Uh, you also open yourself up to con contributions from the engineering teams because you're using the same tooling that they'll already be familiar with it so they can more easily contribute to the docs if they need to. A better understanding of the topics that we write about. So we write about pretty technical things and being able to also work in those tools makes at least me feel more confident in what I'm writing about. Um, and it develops our skills with code, which we need because we're gonna be documenting a bunch of products and reading the engineering team's code. So those are a bunch of benefits. And again, this is all baseline docs as code stuff, but the talk is gonna be a bit more than that. So the talk um, towards the latter half is really gonna be about deploying and hosting. Um, so docs as code is this wonderful way of writing and authoring, um, but it can, I guess it can sometimes stop shy of the actual uh, putting it out into the world and publishing it and making it into production. So at Linode, the docs team uh, sort of extends our responsibilities by also managing the cloud infrastructure that hosts the docs website. So we manage the web servers, um, we manage all of the, well, I guess it's the web servers, the load balancers, that sort of stuff that, that actually publishes the site. Um, and that's, again, what the heart of this talk is gonna be about. Uh, I wanna, before I get too far into that deploying and hosting conversation, I do want to do a quick walkthrough of the sort of beginning parts of the docs as code workflow. So I've put together a diagram and we're going to walk through this. Um, and again, if you've got questions, I'm going to try and leave some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, hopefully we get there around on time. We'll see. Uh, so got a diagram here uh, and we'll walk through it. The diagram I'm going to split roughly into two halves. So the bottom half is going to be uh, sort of the heart of the docs as code methodology. Um, and I've sort of broken that down into authoring uh, on your local workstation, uh, generating local site previews on your workstation, um, the collaboration aspects of docs as code and the testing aspects of Docs code. And then I'm dividing that from the latter half, which is deploying and hosting. Uh, so to start, um, I wanna go through the bottom half of this diagram just to kind of have everybody on the same page. Um, and again, like this is a huge topic of conversation. So um, each of these steps that we're gonna go through in itself is its own little world with 
so many different tools that you can explore. Um, so the first part in the workflow is authoring. Um, when you're writing in, in a Docs code methodology, you're writing in uh, usually in something like plain text. Um, often it's in this dialect called Markdown. Um, that looks like this in your text editor. So you have plain text, you have this, this is an example guide from our library. Um, each one of our guides is this metadata that's at the top and then down below it, it has um, just the content of the guide written in Markdown. Um, after you, or while you're writing in Markdown, you can also generate local site previews on your workstation. Um, so the way this works is we write in Markdown and then this stuff gets translated into HTML web pages. Uh, and we're doing that through something called a static site generator. The static site generator is kind of like a very uh, often used tools tool in the Stocks Code workflow. So it's transmuting that plain text markdown into a fully styled uh, website. Uh, like if you were to go to lino.com slash docs and load a, a, a guide, the static site generator is adding all of the you know, the layout and the colors and the fonts and all this stuff. Uh, but what's nice is that you can run a local version of that on your workstation. Um, doing that is pretty easy. You open up your terminal. Uh, we use a static site generator called Hugo, which is super fast. We have thousands of guides and it compiles it in less than three seconds, which is amazing. Um, and then you can just load it in your browser locally. And then the other nice thing about this is that while I'm writing in Markdown and saving my file, this is automatically updating and refreshing in my browser. Um, and the great thing about all this is that what I'm seeing in my browser is what I'm gonna be getting in production. So that's another big part of this is sort of minimizing the differences between what you have on your own local computer and what is actually served to the world. You wanna keep those kind of as close as you can. Um, did I go too far? Okay. Uh, the other, the next really big part of all this is collaboration. So the docs team that I work on has, I guess, six or seven people right now. Um, and we're all on our own computers working in this workflow with these markdown files and running these local site previews. But at some point we want to put it all together. So we have a shared Git repository. Um, there's so many different ways to host a Git repository. We host it on GitHub which is enormously popular, but you can also host it on GitLab and all these other things. And you don't even have to use Git. There's other version control software out there. I'm not familiar with, I really just know and working in Git. Um, this is really cool because we have, our repository is public. Um, so anybody can contribute to it. Uh, you can, if you are reading a guide uh, and you notice a spelling error, you can download our docs repository, fix the spelling error, and then push it up to our repository and say, hey, I noticed this, would you like to merge in this change that I'm suggesting, and then we'll go ahead and do it. And that helps us because like, when you have as many guides as we do, uh, these things come up with some, you know, a frequency where if we had to fix all of them or notice all of them, it would be too much. Uh, because again, we're not that many people in comparison to how many guides we have in total. Um, and that also plays into my job, which is managing our freelance contribu contribution program. And I'll go into that at the end, but it'll, it also allows us to just accept whole guides or fairly significant guide updates um, from people outside of the Linode organization. Um, if you needed to, you could also have a private repository on GitHub. You don't need to make it public, it's not necessary. Um, but it's a great benefit if you can, I think. Um, yeah, so we're all working locally on our computers. We're all pushing to this shared repository. We could pull each other's work down. So if somebody writes a guide and then I want to review it, all I do is download what they've worked from the shared repository. And then if I need to make changes that I think we should be making, I go ahead and make them push them back up. Um, it's all standard Git workflows. And that's nice too, because there's lots of sort of accumulated built up knowledge about how, uh, you know, the different optimal strategies to work and get uh, look like. Um, so there's lots of existing 
I guess, documentation around Git itself and lots of just shared knowledge over time. And then something I think is really neat is whatever we uh, push our own work up to this shared repository, we're also getting these cool automatic tests that run. Um, and again, this is a core tenant of Docs' code. Uh, the test that we run, uh, a big test that we run is uh, for spell checking. Um, it also does some grammar checking, I think. It uses an open source tool called Veil. Uh, we have some other custom tests. So we have a test that one of our engineers actually wrote for us that checks for 404 links that are broken, or I guess links that are 404s, which would be broken. So for example, let's say we have a guide and it links to another guide, but then we move the other guide. If we don't remember to set up uh, a redirect appropriately for that guide that's been moved, then the link would break uh, for the original one. And then this would automatically flag it. And then we would go in and fix it. And then we can just sort of be sure that all of our guides correctly link to each other because this test is verifying it to be the case. We still need to go in and fix it, but at least we're not wondering. Uh, and I remember when we first implemented this, like it came up with kind of an embarrassing number of <laughs> four or fours that we went in and fixed all at once, but it's sort of therapeutic to like do all of that and just kind of like really clean house. And then we have some other tests that we do um, that are more sort of archaic and specific to our setup that aren't really worth mentioning in this context. So that's kind of like the beginning half of this workflow uh, leading into the, the primary topic for this talk, for the rest of the talk, which is deploying and hosting. Um, at the top, I've got uh, sort of a stand-in of a cloud here, um, which is kind of like representing at some point you're gonna get your stuff available to the world and it's gonna probably live in the cloud somewhere but that's not really well defined yet and we'll go into more detail about that. But um, when we're talking about deploying and hosting, uh, it's also worth mentioning that as part of Docs' code, uh, deploying itself is kind of automatic. So again, we'll fill in the details, but essentially when you work in a system like GitHub, you wanna have some sort of automatic trigger where some action that you determine, that you describe, will cause your production site to be updated with the latest stuff. Um, in our case, in our Git, GitHub repository, we've set that to be uh, whenever we create a so-called release. So a release in GitHub is just like a tag that says like, this point in time in my docs library is significant. Um, and it specifically it signifies that this should be the newest version that we expose to the public. Um, you can do other things too. So uh, instead of having it be a release tag, uh, you could instead say, I want to publish to production whenever I merge into the master branch, which is like the main branch um, in Git. And again, I guess I'll hand wave a little bit of this, but Git has this concept of branches and they're sort of parallel lines of work. And you usually have a main one that gathers sort of like the source of truth for uh, what you want your stuff in your repository to be. Uh, and then off of this, you can have other branches that people temporarily work in that are not necessarily what you want to be the production version of your stuff. So in an, at the end of the day, there's all these different triggers that you can create. You can customize it to however you want it to, but this is what we do at, at Linode. We create these releases and that triggers this deployment mechanism. So now it's time to go into that. Um, let me check the time. I think we've been going for about 13 or 14 minutes, maybe. So, hosting. Uh, again, we've got this sort of abstract cloud. I'm gonna break it down into two kinds of hosting. One is hosting services, uh, which are sort of managed services that fill in a lot of um, stuff for you that you don't have to worry about when you use one of those services. Um, but there's some drawbacks that we'll talk about. And then the other option is self-hosting. So that's creating your own server and your own web server and installing your own web server software and, and doing all this stuff, all this configuration. And you get more control from that. 
Um, but there's a balance, so we'll talk about that. Uh, let's talk about the options for hosting services. So a big one is Netlify. Netlify is geared specifically to static sites. Um, so again, we talk about static sites as this thing where you can transmute Markdown into um, HTML style guides and docs. Uh, and the other key thing to know about static sites is that they don't rely on like a database. Uh, at the end of the day, a static site is just like a collection of HTML files, just like these static files. So Netlify is really primed for that use case. Um, and it works with a bunch of well-known static site generators, uh, Hugo being one of them, that's the one we use. Other ones like Jekyll and a bunch of others that I can't even remember off the top of my head, but there's a bunch. And when you use a tool like Netlify, you get like a nice dashboard um, where you can sort of review the different deploys that have been, that have gone through going back in time. It tells you the time, the commit hash, which is this Git thing uh, that identifies a point in time in your repository. You can set up custom domains, all this stuff, and a bunch of other stuff that I, I can't even really get into here. But the, essentially the nice thing is like, they take care of the hosting. So you don't have to set up a server. You more or less say like, um, you contact the Netlify API, you say, I want to deploy this thing. It goes, goes ahead and does it, and then it's available at your domain. Um, and you don't even actually usually have to use the API. It has a GitHub integration that's built in. So you don't have to touch all that stuff. You can just hook up, you know, it's like when you have like Facebook, you hook up your Facebook to your, uh, I don't know, some game or whatever, and then it just talks to each other. Uh, same thing here. You, tell GitHub, I want Netlify to connect, and then connects, and then you just toggle some checkboxes in this interface, and then it does what you want. Um, so it's it's sophisticated. After that, we've got, I won't go through every option, but I'll go through like some top level ones. There's one called Vercel, which was called Zeit up until recently. Um, it's a similar idea. Uh, I think it, I'm not sure I haven't used it myself, but I think it is more narrow in scope than Netlify, perhaps, in terms of what frameworks it accepts, but I'm not 100% certain about that, but it's a similar idea. Um, after that, GitHub Pages. So this is cool. Um, this diagram is even a little weird when you think about GitHub Pages. It has this arrow from GitHub to GitHub. Again, really, it's all just in one place. Basically, what you do is you have a repository in Git that has these HTML files from your static site, and then it just publishes it. Um, I don't think it has like a dashboard like Netlify does or like Vercel does. Um, it's kind of more simple than that, but it's a free option. I don't know if there's even a paid option for it, but it's free. I think you can have custom domains, um, but it's sort of the same idea. You don't think about the hosting at all. You just It just kind of pops up at your domain. They take care of all that stuff. Uh, and then another one I want to shout out is called Heroku. Uh, this is, I think, a little bit more than the other ones in that you can run like databases and stuff on it, but it still has kind of sort of these um, lanes that it expects you to fall in for your application. So you kind of like in some ways have to like wrap your application up in a way that is compatible with Heroku. And that's sort of vague, but the idea is like, it's not quite as flexible as just like your own server, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So hosting services, what are the pros and cons? Uh, pros, ease of use, like we said, dashboards, and they are often Jamstack native. native. Jamstack is this acronym. Uh, it's, oh my God, my mind is blanking. Um, JavaScript, APIs, and Markdown, I think is what it stands for. Um, it, it's just like an umbrella term for things like Hugo and Jekyll and all these other static sites um, and Gatsby and, and other stuff. Cons would be cost. Uh, it's usually more expensive to run on one of these services than like a, like a generic, not generic, but like a sort of like more open cloud host. Um, there could be limitations in terms of like whether or not your app is compatible. Um, Again, maybe you need to run a database or something and Netlify doesn't support that. It could come up. 
Uh, and then maybe you'll have organization limitations. So what I mean by that is like, let's say for whatever reason, your organization doesn't permit you to run on one of these platforms. You have to use some sort of prescribed hosting service like a, a Linode, for example, or you know something like that. Um, and in that case, you have to maybe play along with that and perhaps go the self-hosting self -hosting route. So self-hosting, it's when you run on your own server on a cloud for, platform like Linode, you install any software that your docs needs, uh, databases, web servers, whatever. It has lower cost. Um, the base plan for Linode is five bucks a month. I think the base plan, plan for Netlify is like 20 bucks a month. They have a free tier, but I don't know what doesn't get you. And then it's typically more complex because you got to set up all of the stuff that we're talking about. I'm going to modify this diagram. So instead of there being an abstract cloud, you have a web server. So this is kind of my represent representation of the web server. Uh, in our case, this is pretty accurate to what we run at Linode. Uh, an example is that we have Nginx running as our web server, Hugo is the static site generator, and then right below, I have this kind of bash script mocked up. Um, what this is doing is building the site. So the idea is when you release to GitHub a tag, uh, it notifies the web server that that has happened, and then the web server grabs the latest from GitHub, builds it with Hugo to generate those eight new HTML files, and then starts serving it with Nginx. Um, and that's summarized here, actually. Um, but I think I'm running short on time, so I'm, I might not go into all these details here. But it, I think it re just recaps what I just said. So um, let's zoom in on the server itself. So we've got a web server. We've got a bunch of software installed on it and a build script installed on it. But how did it get there? And this is kind of the heart of what I want to talk about, the takeaway for this talk, um, is how do you set something up the, like this in a way that you're also sort of following this docs as code philosophy? So in docs as code, you're sort of declaring all this, this stuff in code and you're not doing anything sort of like by hand, everything is automatic. How do you embody that philosophy when you're setting up your web server? Well, um, let's imagine that you have a blank server that doesn't have any software installed on it or build scripts or whatever. It's just a fresh server. It's running Linux and nothing else. You have an option. You can install the services by hand. So you could log in by SSH, do install a Nginx, install Hugo. Um, you could upload by SSH that build script I was talking about. But that's error prone. Uh, you may get some of the commands wrong. Um, it can take a lot of time sometimes. And I didn't mention this in the slide, but it's also sometimes a security risk. Because if you make an error that has security implications, maybe you have left something open that you didn't need to, that sort of thing. So the alternative that I suggest, or that we use at Linode, is configuration management. So configuration management is, again, it's this sort of embodying the philosophy of doing things in code. So instead of logging in manually, you create these sort of declarative installation instructions where you write down what you want the desired state of the server to be. So I, do I want it to have a Nginx installed? Well, what you do is you say, uh, you don't say install Nginx, you say, I want Nginx to be installed. And then so on for these other things like Git and Hugo and all this other stuff. And then what you do is you, you take this, instruction set or this formula and you run it with a configuration management tool and there's a bunch out there we'll go through one and then what that tool does is it says I have this formula I want the state of the server to match what this formula says so I have a fresh server and the formula says it needs to have nginx it needs to have hugo it needs to have git it needs to have you know other stuff the tool will say well the server doesn't have anything on it right now so I'm gonna go ahead and install all that stuff. Um, but the cool thing is if you run this tool again on the same formula, it's not gonna try and do things again because it, it, before it does anything, it checks the current state of your server. So it says, do you, have, do you need Nginx? Well, you already have Nginx, so I'm not gonna reinstall it. So 
it produces the same result every time that you run the instructions. And the reason I bring that up is because it's removing error. Um, you can still make an error when you're writing a formula uh, and, and you want to fix those things, but you won't make any errors in terms of running this formula. It'll be the same result every single time, which is great. Um, a specific tool that we use, the one that we use at Linode for the doc site is called salt. I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple of what these formulas look like. So salt, you can see here, this is a formula that installs Git and Hugo. So we've got a uh, part of this formula that says git package, it says package.install, and then it gives the name of git. And so this is what I mean by, you're not saying install git, you're saying I want git to be installed. It's declarative. Similar for Hugo, um, you tell it the name of Hugo. And in this case, this is cool, you're giving it a specific URL to grab Hugo from. So in the first one with Git, you're using the native Linux package manager that, you're, uh, that the server is running. But in the second one, you're grabbing it from a more specific place. Um, and you have that level of flexibility. Uh, after that, this is another uh, sort of part of the formula where what you're doing is, I mentioned before you have this um, deploy script that runs every time the, the website needs to update where it grabs the latest from Git from your docs repo and then it builds it and then it serves that with Nginx. What this is doing is it's uploading that deploy script uh, to the server so that it has it and then it runs it. Um, as soon as you upload it, it will run it in initial time so that the server has the docs uh, ready to be served. And actually a neat thing here is at the bottom, under command.run, there's this require stanza where it's saying require build script, require Hugo site repo, require Nginx document root. I don't want to go too into detail, but that's neat uh, because it signifies that this part of the formula has a dependency on an earlier part of a formula. So you can set these dependency chains up so that everything runs in the order that it needs to, essentially. Uh, okay, so cool. We have our server. Salt can set up all of our services, but we have a problem. We kind of assumed that we had the server, but we don't initially. What we have at the start is, is nothing, right? We have maybe an account on Linode, but you still need to create a server. To do that, you could do it again by hand. Um, you could log into the Linode Cloud Manager, click Create, choose the plan that you want, all that stuff. But again, that's error prone. You might create the wrong plan. It can take time to correct errors, that sort of stuff. And then beyond that, you might also want to take advantage of something like a high availability deployment. So this is when you have several servers working in tandem. And there's a few great reasons to do this. One is, let's say one of the servers fails. The other ones will take over. Uh, also, it's great for handling spikes in traffic because four servers can handle more traffic than one server or five servers or six or however many you want. So if you were to create these servers by hand in the cloud manager, you have to worry about, am I doing the same thing every time? Again, it's, it's this issue of human error. So there's another infrastructure as co code tool. And again, I didn't really bring this up earlier, but the whole sort of umbrella that this falls under is this category called infrastructure as code. And that's called Terraform. So Terraform is different from Salt in that Salt installs services on a server that already exists. Terraform creates servers to begin with. Uh, so essentially what you're doing is you're saying, I have nothing. I want to go ahead and create a sort of formula like I did with Salt. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Terraform to create all the things that are in this formula. Um, and again, what's neat about this is that if you were to tell Terraform to create, to run this formula multiple times, Terraform would understand that you've already run it before and won't recreate things unnecessarily. The formula that we're looking at right now uh, creates two servers. One is a web server and one is a database server. Um, and again, you can feed it different uh, parameters like the, the plan for the server, where what region it should be in, that sort of thing. 
And at that point, once you're using Terraform, you've kind of solved the whole equation. You have a way to automatically install services and a way to create servers. And fortunately, there's a way to tie these two things together. So when you use Terraform, there's a plugin that allows you to automatically take the salt formulas that we have that installs all our servers, services like Nginx and all these things, and allows you to automatically upload them to the instances that you're creating with Terraform. And then furthermore, you can download that salt tool to the instance and then just immediately run that formula. So you get kind of an all-in-one command setup for your servers. You click or run a command, a single command at the command line, and it creates the servers, sets salt up on it, installs everything through salt, and then you have a working server. Uh, it's sort of an end-to-end -end solution. Um, and again, the whole point of all this is to embody that philosophy of, of doing Doxus code the whole way through, from authoring to testing to hosting. Um, the team at Linode does this um, sort of on our own. We took ownership of doing this. Uh, we, it used to be the engineering team's responsibility. Um, we really pride ourselves on doing this because it takes something off of their plate. And it also gives us, again, a feeling of ownership of everything that we're doing. Um, you might want to consider doing it in your organization for similar reasons. Uh, if you can take some plate work off your engineering team's plate, it could help them maybe with, you know, running a new product with the time that they have left over, that sort of thing. Um, and you can still be doing this in a way that abides by those organizational policies that you might have that uh, you need to keep in mind. And again, that depends on your organization. Um, we have, I'm not sure how close I am to time, but I think I'm pretty close. We have in our library of guides and tutorials, which is at linode.com slash docs, we have two guides that I wanna bring up that are kind of relevant to this discussion. One is called automate, Automating Static Site Deployments with Salt, Git, and Webhooks. And that's pretty cool because it is almost literally all the things that we do to publish our own docs. Um, if you follow that guide, you will end up with basically what Linode uses to, do, to host linode.com slash docs. It's kind of like a real life test example of the stuff in the guide. That does not cover the Terraform stuff. We have a separate guide called Using Terraform to Provision Linode Environments. That, so that tells you how to set up Linode's instances. Um, and uh, if you want to like go further into tying Terraform and Salt together, there is official documentation from Terraform that shows you how to like upload the Salt stuff and um, use the Salt provisioner um, with Terraform. Um, but I don't, I don't think we have a guide that unifies those two things right now. Um, but individually, they're they're pretty. Those are pretty handy guys for getting started with this stuff. Uh, I guess we have some time for. I actually have no idea if somebody can help me figure out if we have any time for questions and answers. Sorry if I've gone on too long. Uh, now you're right on time, Nathan. So thanks, thanks really for this. This has been really helpful, uh, at least to me. I, I know there's quite a few people out there who'd be interested. So if anyone's got any questions, feel free to either sort of unmute yourself and ask the question directly instead of chatting, if that works. I'm um, so sorry. I've got a question here from Michael. Can you hear me, Nathan? Is that all good? Yes. Okay. So there's a uh, question it's which asks, could you please repeat the name of the tool you use to do spell checks? Yep, it's called Veil. Cameron, yep. uh, got it. Um, yeah, just Google um, Veil spell checking and I think it'll come up. Okay. If anyone else has got any questions, feel free to jump on. Just unmute yourself if you've got any questions for Nathan. Our, um, our documentation repo again on GitHub has rules for Veil that we use listed. So if you were curious about what spelling checkers we use within Veil, you can take a look at it and I'll pause. Okay. Yeah, hey, uh, I have a question. Uh, my name is Reza, thanks, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm wondering how you manage uh, your diagrams and, and photos that you have on the 
on the website. I understand in the markdown we can um, include images, but the image itself, uh, where do you keep them? Is there any workflow to um, to review them and and things about all things about photos and diagramming in general? Thank you. So diagramming is like an enormous subject that I don't know enough about. Um, we don't really have a specific workflow for workflow for that. Um, and we want to do more in that area. Um, usually right now it's just a matter of us when we're writing a guide, if we think we can make a you know compelling diagram, we'll do it on our computer and then just add it as either a PNG or an SVG that's embedded in the, in the doc. But we currently don't have much process around that. Um, but I was just at Write the Docs in Portland and they gave a talk on it. Um, and I think they post the talks online, so it might be worth going to the Write the Docs Portland conference and seeing if they can, if they have that video up yet, because I know there's a bunch of cool stuff. Cool, thank you. Hi, Nathan. Uh, my name is Gauri, and uh, thanks for the presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, my question is around uh, the review process. Uh, since you use Markdown, I'm just wondering how you get all the reviews done with all the stakeholders. Is it outside of the system or is there a way in which you can, you know, kind of send it out for review? Um, that's an interesting question. So um, I didn't mention this in the diagram because I thought it would probably confuse things a little bit and at least the flow that I was presenting, but um, when we submit a pull request in GitHub, uh, I mentioned that we run Travis uh, as a testing tool, this automatic testing tool. We also run Netlify, even though we don't use it in production. And the cool thing is that Netlify can create sort of unique um, URLs for every pull request that you do. And the great thing about that is it allows you to bring in other stakeholders. So like the workflow is essentially, I am writing in Markdown, some guide, and then I submit a pull request. And then Netlify automatically generates a um, preview of that at some public domain that's kind of random. It has some alphanumeric string. And then I, I just send that over to my coworker. Like let's say I'm doing a guide about Linode's tax policies. I write it. I get the Netlify preview, I send that link in Slack to my finance team and say, hey, does this look right to you? Um, and then at that point, that, that team is not gonna be working in Markdown to submit fixes, but they can tell me right. and then I can integrate it. Um, and I guess if somebody was adventurous enough on that team, they could do it, um, but yeah, they would, yeah. Great, thanks, Nathan. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Thanks, thanks for the talk again, Nathan, and thanks for the questions as well. I think we just sort of, we're not running out of time, but I think we've just got time for one more. So um, Cameron, if you wanna share your screen, if you wanna do your quick sort of talk. Yes, let me just do that. Cool, so uh, can you hear me all good? Yep. Yep, um, so uh, um, really great talk, love it, thank you. Um, we, one of the things I've been involved in is trying to answer a bunch of these questions that I, I notice are actually getting asked in this question here. Um, and we have been, there are a bunch of standard problems that you keep on running into whenever you write documentation. And us tech writers have sort of started banding together under a, a project we call the Good Docs Project, which we launched the first um, alpha version at Write the Docs. 2019 and what we want to do is go in and um, launch it uh, the next release of it at write the docs in 2020 and we want to go in and we're our aim is to actually go in and take these um, uh, to, to take a whole bunch of things that we're doing um, and focus on them and we've sort of got a community of I'm, I'm guessing somewhere between about 10 and 20 people depending on, on how you do your counting um, who are tech writers and associated people who are all trying to tackle some of these problems um, so writing templates that 
you would take to, and we initially started with the um, the open source projects and said, what, what would be the ideal set of templates that you would give to an open source project to ensure that you've got, um, to get techies up and running as fast as possible? And then once you have the templates, what's the architecture that you should use? How, how do you use these templates and how do you sort of link them all together? Um, and then the other one is, yeah, you've got a whole lot of docs, but how do you actually know that they're good? And there isn't really a very good definition of good docs. There's a bunch of things out there. And so we've got uh, a proposal for a good docs audit framework. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things around glossaries and how to, how to do glossaries well. Anyone can write actually a glossary, but, but, but to actually do cross-domain management of glossaries where you inherit from a standards body list of terms over here, and then you go and sort of update, and then you go and go and translate all your terms. There's actually a, quite a mess of problems around this, and we're going to a, sort of aim to try and knock that over by December. Um, and also style guides going in, and how do you, we, we don't actually want to encourage people to write tons of style guides, but rather, how do you actually take an existing style guide and add in the unique parts of your project into an existing style guide. And there's a bunch of other things, and this is sort of just the, the touch of what we're wanting to do sort of immediately. Um, we, we have a, we, I, we've, we've collated the, an essay which is about a half hour read, and that's just like, like about half a paragraph, no, sorry, about a paragraph or two per, per concept. Um, and, um, as a taster, I've, I've offered to talk about that in our next presentation. So if you want to get involved, we'd really love to have more collaborators. And, and the really good part about this is it's an international project, but Australia is really punching above its weight. And we've got a lot of Australians in on this project. And so if you want to take part and be in your own time zone for a change, then um, reach out to us. Um, I probably should actually give you an email. The Good Docs project is um, has links to it from the contact page and uh, join our Slack channel and say hello, or alternatively, um, my email address is down the bottom uh, there, oops, sorry, uh, cameron.shorter at gmail.com. Uh, that's it from me. Any questions? Thanks, Cameron. All right, I think we've just got about 10 minutes left. So I'm just gonna share my screen again. I've just got a couple of slides that I need to finish off on. Um, just let me share my screen. Um, yeah, this was something that I was talking about earlier on and Nathan can probably add more stuff in here. So Linode's just launched their, I think, data center in Sydney last year. So if you, so one of the things that I guess with a lot of organizations and he, he mentioned some of this in organization limit limitations, I guess, of hosting docs as code was, you, you need, there's obviously that security aspect of having cloud providers within your own sort of um, region. So I think Linode sort of works on that at the moment. Uh, so you've got one in Sydney, which is more local than a, a, a data center somewhere um, outside Australia. And I think they've also given us a promotional offer for, for signing up to Linode. And if you want to try it out, there's a, there's a promo code right there if you need to sign up to this um, offer. Um, Nathan, did you have anything to add to that, or? Um, no, yeah, I mean that offer is great. <laughs> the, just for like a frame of reference, um, the, the base Linux plan is five bucks a month. Um, you could get one that's like mid tier for like twenty bucks a month, and use it for quite a while. I guess you have ninety days on this, but that's you get my point. Okay, cool. Thank you. you. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to mention that's not really related to this credit is I just, I wanted to bring it up before we finished. Um, so I I run our freelance contributors program um, for Linode where people can submit guides and tutorials and then get paid for it. Um, it's called Write for Linode. Um, if you want to take a look, just Google Write for Linode. Um, 
and if you have any ideas for stuff you might want to write about that would fit into our, our library, um, there's like a form on that page. And go from there. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right, so just talking a bit of a conference update. We've got the Write the Docs Australia and India conference happening this year on the 3rd and 4th of December. So call for proposals are open. We've got a, another maybe a couple of weeks at the most 31st August midnight is when they close. So if you've got an idea for a presentation or, propose, um, or proposal for a talk or um, even like a little workshop sort of a thing, um, get onto it, get that's the link. It's, it's all there, it talks about how do you go about submitting proposals as an example proposal as well, if you want to look at what other people have been doing. So get um, get submitting, I guess. Um, and just a little bit, while we are on that topic of the conference, we also need volunteers. So at the moment, the team's looking a little bit bare bone. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in adding to your experience, um, uh, contributing to the community, if you want to jump onto that page, it lists out a few roles that we'll be looking at. Um, and it also goes, uh, there's a link to the event roles in terms of what's really required. So uh, just be careful, be mindful that some of those roles are more um, sort of biased towards on-site um, conferences, but the remote is a whole different kettle of fish. I was a part of the Ride the Docs Portland, just getting up to see what, what was happening. And it was a big sort of a effort from all the volunteers. So if you, if you want to jump on and volunteer for our annual conference, um, get, get in touch um, through various channels, I guess, with the Ride the Docs. Um, there's a Slack channel, obviously, where Australia channel, on the Australian channel, you can put, post a message or get in, um, touch with me directly and yeah uh, as Nathan mentioned before the write the docs Portland um, talks are now available on YouTube so I'll post this link in the in the on the actual meetup page as well so people can start looking at it I think it's also gone out in the newsletter this morning so um, all the talks all the lightning talks and presentations that happened at Portland last week are all available now so that's pretty much it from me I'm gonna stop sharing uh, if anyone's got any uh, last minute comments or any questions, let me have a look at the chat window. Uh, yep, there's a few things around on the Good Docs project. But, all right, um, so thanks again for your time. This has been really lovely. Thanks, Nathan. I know it's sort of a little bit of a late hour for you, but thanks for jumping on and contributing to our um, meetup. And, we, I'll have this recording up on YouTube in a couple of days so people can um, have a look at it. And if they've got any questions, are, are you happy to share your slides as well, Nathan, if, if someone wants to have a look at the slides and what you've done? Uh, yeah, should I just send them to you or? Yeah, if you just uh, send it to me, I'll just push, put it on, I'll put it on the link with the video as well. Okay, I'll do that after we finish up. Cool. All right. Thank you. So thanks, everyone. Um, and we will catch up in a month or so for the next remote event. Thank you. And see ya. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.